Ben Drowned is one of the most important pieces of internet fiction ever created. This might seem like a big claim to make, especially when the likes of the Mandela Catalog, Petscop, and Local 58 exist. Of course, Ben precedes all of them and has clearly left its mark on the internet, inspiring many that would go on to create their own works of internet fiction. It was such a simple concept, at first, merely a retelling of a familiar story. A college student is feeling nostalgic and decides that it is time to play some of the games of their youth. With their console of choice, the N64, picked out, all that's left is to find that one specific game. The game that would become the catalyst for their story. And one that was an invaluable piece of their childhood. The game that was picked didn't really matter. It was the nostalgia that was important. These stories always cared more about the feelings the author had towards the game rather than the game itself. The story would then pick up with the strange occurrences and misremembering of their nostalgic moments. There were now new enemies, or every NPC was now missing. Themes of loneliness, isolation, and inverted expectations were the go-to for this genre. The horror of this type of story showed itself through how the game was essentially different from when they'd played it as a kid, subverting their nostalgia. Usually this was to the extreme with gore, fourth wall breaks, or even murder by the hands of the game. This type of story was popular within the gaming creepypasta community, a community that loved to share their horror stories revolving around games from when we were all young. Sometimes the community would write a story about a non-existent game, but it was mostly a twisting of our shared nostalgia, especially for Nintendo and Sega properties. The concept was popular enough for millions of stories to be shared across the internet, many of these becoming household names and not just within the community that created them. This story, which sounds so familiar, had to have had a starting point, a story which preceded and influenced the genre. And just like Local 58 kicked off the internet's obsession with analog horror, Ben asserted its influence on the gaming creepypasta genre. The story of an unnamed author buying a haunted game cartridge at a yard sale, which quickly spirals into a world of intrigue and hauntings. Ben's story started back in 2009 and was a precursor to this whole subgenre, and likely the popularization of the haunted gaming phenomenon that took place soon after. It was the easily identifiable focal point for, more than likely, the entire gaming creepypasta genre. As influential as the story was, it did have some help in creating its world and narrative. The story of Ben Drowned actually starts before the first post was ever made. The story goes all the way back to the game that was chosen. That game being The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask is a game that has permeated through the entirety of the internet subculture. Even before Ben, there was a community obsession with this game. Majora was a very different Zelda game, a word that I don't use lately. Whereas most Zelda games seem to focus on the grand adventure, Majora instead focused on a smaller world and its inhabitants. Majora's Mask was a game created out of the limitations set upon it. The game was to be created in less than two years using the same already created engine of its predecessor. This led to many of the core mechanics of the game. For starters, the time mechanic was taken from a completely different game, one that was never completed as the director moved to work on Majora. This time mechanic is one of the most important aspects of the game and is the piece that makes the game feel so unique. The three-day time cycle was also important for the plot as the entire game revolved around it, but also was an important theme for the dev team. A moon was set to crash into Termina on the eve of the third night after Link arrives. This coincides with a festival called the Carnival of Time. The time constraint put on the team definitely shines through with the clear symbolism of the moon looming overhead, like they must have felt working on one of the biggest gaming franchises under the watchful eye of Nintendo, coming down upon them. With the dev time, it was almost impossible for the team to create new character models for every NPC. So they instead took the ones from Ocarina of Time and changed them. This oftentimes led to them getting more personality and character than their Ocarina of Time counterparts. It also meant that the devs needed to make sure each NPC felt wholly unique to their prior uses, which led to the side quest system. Link in the Land of Termina has the opportunity to help the people that live there, which becomes the core of the game just trying to make the lives of the NPCs better than they are, because the clock is ticking. Notice that I said better, 
as Link isn't fixing their lives, just helping them with the problems they're able to fix. The moon hanging overhead is a persistent point that every NPC in the game takes notice of. Some see it as the largest threat imaginable, while others see it simply as a facade that has no bearing on their current predicaments. The world is facing tragedy, that much is clear, and that helps to set its somber tone. But the part that really sells it are the NPCs. In the world of Termina, every NPC needs Link's help. They are all struggling with personal issues, some that Link is able to quell, and others he's not. The reason that I bring this all up is that I believe these themes, theories, and the general world of Majora's Mask helped inspire Ben Drowned. There are themes that fit well within the narrative of that original game. With the knowledge of the game, we can now see where the story begins. Ben Drowned was an ARG that was created by Alex Hall. It started its story back in 2009 through a series of posts on the X 4chan board. The ARG was split into three arcs, those being the Haunted Cartridge, Moon Children, and Awakening. Each arc felt distinct from each other, but held onto the same themes and story throughout. The first arc, the Haunted Cartridge arc, is the most prevalent version of the story that the internet knows. This part of the story is also what many called the creepy pasta arc. The haunted cartridge was the beginning and also where a lot of people thought the story ended. It told the story at its most linear and would establish many of the gaming creepy pasta tropes that would go on to become staples of the genre. The story begins with an unnamed narrator's posts on 4chan. I recently moved into my dorm room starting as a sophomore in college and a friend of mine gave me his old Nintendo 64 to play. I was stoked to say the least. I could finally play all of those old games of my youth that I hadn't touched in at least a decade. The Nintendo 64 came with one yellow controller and a rather shoddy copy of Super Smash Bros. And while beggars can't be choosers, needless to say, it didn't take long until I became bored of beating up the computer players. That weekend, I decided to drive around a few neighborhoods about 20 minutes or so off campus hitting up the local garage sales, hoping to score on some good deals from ignorant parents. I ended up picking up a copy of Pokemon Stadium, GoldenEye, F-Zero, and two other controllers for $2. Satisfied, I began to drive out of the neighborhood when one last house caught my attention. I still have no idea why it did. There were no cars there and only one table was set up with random junk on it, but something sort of drew me there. I usually trust my gut on these things, so I got out of the car and was greeted by an old man. His outward appearance was, for a lack of a better word, displeasing. It was odd. If you asked me to tell you why I thought it was displeasing, I couldn't really pinpoint anything. There was just something about him that put me on edge. I can't explain it. All I can tell you is that, if it wasn't in the middle of the afternoon and there were other people within shouting distance, I would not have even thought of approaching this man. He flashed a crooked smile at me and asked what I was looking for. And immediately I noticed that he must be blind in one of his eyes. His right eye had that glazed over look about it. I forced myself to look at his left eye instead, trying not to offend, and asked him if he had any old video games. I was already wondering how I could politely excuse myself from the situation when he told me that he had no idea what a video game was. But to my surprise, he said he had a few ones in an old box. He assured me he'd be back in a jiffy, and turned to head back into the garage. As I watched him hobble away, I couldn't help but notice what he was selling on his table. Littered across his table were rather peculiar paintings, various artworks that looked like ink blots that a psychiatrist might show you. Curious, I looked through them. It was obvious why no one was visiting this guy's garage sale. These weren't exactly aesthetically pleasing. As I came to the last one, for some reason it looked almost like Majora's Mask. The same heart-shaped body with little spikes protruding outward. Initially, I just thought that since I was secretly hoping to find that game at these garage sales, some Ferudian bowl was projecting itself into the ink blots. but given the events that happened afterward, I'm not so sure anymore. I should have asked the man about it. I wish I would have asked the man about it. After staring at the Majora-shaped blot, I looked up and the old man was suddenly there again, arms length in front of me, smiling at me. 
I'll admit I jumped out of reflex, and I laughed nervously as he handed me a Nintendo 64 cartridge. It was a standard gray color, except that someone had written Majora on it in black permanent marker. I got butterflies in my stomach as I realized what a coincidence this was and asked how much he wanted for it. The old man smiled at me and told me that I could have it for free. That he used to belong to a kid who was about my age. They didn't live here anymore. There was something weird about how the man phrased that, but I didn't really pay any attention to it then. I was too caught up in not only finding this game, but getting it for free. I reminded myself to be a bit skeptical since this looked like a pretty shady cartridge and there's no guarantee it would work. But then the optimist inside me interjected that maybe it was some kind of beta version or pirated version of the game. And that was all I needed to be back on cloud nine. I thanked the man and the man smiled at me and wished me well saying goodbye then. At least that's what it sounded like to me. All the way in the car ride home, I had a nagging doubt that the man had said something else. My fears were confirmed when I booted up the game. To my surprise, it worked just fine. And there was one save file named simply Ben. Goodbye, Ben. He was saying goodbye, Ben. I felt bad for the man. Obviously a grandparent and obviously going senile. And I, for some reason or another, reminded him of his grandson, Ben. From here, our unnamed narrator started playing the game. He also noticed that the Ben file was on day three and had an owl save at the Stone Tower Temple, near the end of the game. Ben was so close to completing the game, but never did for some reason. The narrator named his character Link and was happy to see the game ran almost perfectly. There were a few hiccups like weird flashings during cutscenes, but that didn't really bother him. What did bother him though was that the NPCs would mostly call him Link, but on rare occasions, they would call him Ben. This then led to him deleting the Ben file from the game. This didn't fix the problem though, with the town folks sometimes not calling him by name at all. There would just be a blank space where his name would go. This was only the start of the weirdness though. While playing through the game, the narrator decides that he needs more time to complete one of the dungeons in the game. So he decides to do the fourth day glitch. This glitch can be done with the telescope at the Astral Observatory. After he finished the glitch, he found himself inside of the final boss room. There he saw Skull Kid and was greeted with weird text. The text was from a different part of the game. Follow up text would ask, go to the lair of the temple boss, yes, no. The narrator quickly found out that he couldn't select no, so he took a breath and clicked yes. He was quickly greeted by the text that read, dawn of a new day. This one screen filled the narrator with a strong feeling of dread. He wasn't sure where it was coming from. He's not even sure he described the feeling quite right. The game had loaded him back into Clocktown, but nothing was right. There were textures missing all around the town and there didn't seem to be any other NPCs in sight. It was just Link with four hearts and the hero's bow. The most chilling part was the Song of Healing, which appeared to be playing in reverse with an occasional laugh from the happy mask salesman. The narrator tried to leave Clocktown, but every exit would send him to another part of the town. He wasn't allowed to leave the town and he wasn't sure why. He was starting to feel trapped within the town. This feeling coupled with the missing textures, the music that was getting louder as he played, or the laugh, were all starting to drain on his sanity. He decided that the only way to get rid of this was to go to the laundry pool and drown himself. It was the only way to kill Link and reset the game. As he entered the pool, Link grabbed his head and the happy mask salesman appeared on the screen for a second. He appeared to be looking at him, not at Link, but the narrator himself. A familiar sound played and the Elegy of Emptiness Link statue appeared before him. The narrator ran back into the town and that's when he noticed that the thing was following him. At random intervals, it would play the animation and reappear closer to him. Everywhere that the narrator would go, the statue would follow. He went into the dojo and the statue would reappear with the same animation. It even appeared to block him near the back of the dojo. He ran down a tunnel until the game seemed to reset with the screen reading, Dawn of a New Day. When the game came back, Link was standing on top of the clock tower with the Skull Kid floating above. This section might be better just to show you what happened rather than tell you.
<laughs> when the game finally reset, the file name was changed to your turn. This file when opened would show a dead link laying on the ground. Skull Kid was floating in the air before him. The narrator reset the game and was met with another new file. Ben was back in the exact spot it had been before being deleted. At the Stone Tower Temple, right before the moon was set to crash into Termina. This is when the narrator turned it off and decided he needed sleep. As the story was unfolding, each part of his retellings were also accompanied by gameplay. The gameplay matched near perfectly with the story, all the video being uploaded to his YouTube channel, Jedusable. Also on the channel were two videos that won't be important until later. These videos are a Vampire the Masquerade video titled Rosa and a prototype gameplay video titled Prototype All Consume Kills. Jaduzable, as we'll now be referring to him as, doesn't remember uploading these videos, but does say that he shared this account with a friend. Jaduzable's dreams turned quickly to nightmares. Last night that Elegy of Eminence statue, I had a dream about it. I dreamed that it was following me in my dream. That I would be minding my own business when I'd feel my neck hair stand up on end. I would turn around and that thing, that horrible, lifeless statue would be staring with those empty eyes right at me, merely inches away. In my dreams, I remember calling it Ben, and never before had I had a dream that I could remember so vividly. But the important thing is, I did get some sleep, I suppose. Moving on, the next day Jaduzable went back to see if that old man was home, the one that had given him the game. No such luck, as the house looked empty and the car in the parkway was gone. He did bump into the neighbor, though who only told him what he expected already. The old man was moving and he hasn't been home in a while. Eventually he did ask who Ben was. The conversation suddenly became very serious. He explained that around eight years ago, there was an accident with a boy named Ben in the neighborhood. And soon after, the family moved away never to be heard from again. That was all the man would say on the subject. And so Jaduzable went back to his dorm. He started up the game again, needing to see what else it had in store for him. When he did so, he was brought back to the main menu with Your Turn and Ben as the only selectable files. He gathered up the courage to select the Ben file. When he loaded in, he was met with strangeness immediately. The text for the stone temple only said stone. There was also an accompanying text box that was complete gibberish. Strangest of all was Link. He was bent in a horrific way. He was bent sideways with a blank look on his face. It was as if Link had died and was now being controlled as a puppet. Deducible noticed a new item in his inventory that looked like a note but nothing happened when he tried to use it. A weird sound that he hadn't heard before would play but nothing else would happen. He was able to move around for about two minutes before the Elegy of Emptiness statue spawned in and the game reset again. A dawn of a new day screen appeared and now Link was a Deku scrub, again in Clock Town though. Tattle, his fairy companion, spoke her usual lines, but cut off with gibberish. Jaduzable turned around and headed inside the clock tower to talk to the Happy Mask salesman. He said his iconic line, You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Right before the screen faded into white. When it faded back in, Link was back in human form out in Termino Field. Standing in the field were the Happy Mask salesman, Skull Kid, the Link Elegy, and Epona. They all seemed to be just idle. Creepy though, the Happy Mask Salesman's face would follow Link wherever he went. Eventually, Jaduzable decided to play his ocarina. The sound played that meant this is what you were supposed to do. He played the Song of Healing, 
which is a song taught by the happy mask salesman. After the song was done, this happened. The screen changed to Link transforming into his Zora form. The scene now had Link at Great Temple Bay. On the coast was Epona, and she appeared to be pointing out towards something in the water. Deducible swam with Link in that direction and found an elegy statue floating in the water before he drowned. The Zora are able to breathe underwater, but somehow he still drowned. The game acted as if it had been reset. It sent him back to the start screen, asking him to press start. He already knew it was coming. The file name had changed again. The first one said Ben, the other said Drowned. Ben had drowned. Jaducible uploads another video, Drowned.wmv, but doesn't really talk about what happens in that video. Instead he just says that he misses his family, that his school is too far away from home, he is scared and just wants to go home. The next update we get is from Jaducible's roommate. He states that he went home and is taking time away from school. This comes as no surprise, but his roommate also notes his deteriorating physical state as well, saying he hadn't been eating or even left his room in a few days. Before he left, Jaducible asked him to post this response to everyone and then post his notes called the truth.txt. His final request was to upload a video to his channel titled Jaducible. All of this was to be posted on the 15th of September. Before this text file went live, this story seemed pretty simple on the surface a haunted game cartridge that was trying to tell Jaducible something. But after this text file plus video hit the internet, the whole story begins to unravel. The very first line says that the entity known as Ben has been censoring his summaries. He had left clues to look for in the videos, such as having the lens of truth or mask of truth equipped on one of his C buttons, or talking to a gossip stone. There were also clues hidden in the video tags. These were just a few of the ways that Jaducible was trying to tell everyone that not everything was as it seemed. The document also is the first time we hear the name of Jaducible's friend, the friend that went with him to try and find the old man. His name is Tyler, and he will be important later. This note is also when he mentions not remembering uploading the Rosa video. This video seems to foreshadow everything that is going to happen in this ARG, or at least parts of it. Let's check it out. Why is he smiling? The father. I don't know what I'm saying. Forget what I say. The crimson sheep is not who he says she is and is going to burn. Dinosaurs. He's furious. The man at the crest. The voice in the darkness. Boss. Chinese brothers. Follow the lights to the end of the tunnel. Where do you want to go? Hmm. The man on the couch. The lone wolf. All others, tread carefully. Men, everywhere. Some with swords, some with smiles. But I pity them. You are a reliable fool. Don't open it. Whether or not you win the game matters not. It's if you bought it. The note also mentioned that Ben seemed to censor summaries, with the first censored one being Ben.wmv. In it, there was no mention of the Moon Children or his experience with seeing Ben in the real world. Jaducible goes on to explain his dream. The Moon Children appeared in my dreams last night. They lifted up their masks to reveal their hideously disfigured faces. Maggots crawling out of their orifices, sunk in black holes where their eyes should be, a yellow smile that slowly grew bigger and bigger as they came closer to me. They told me that they wanted me to play. I tried to run from them, but the four children pinned me down to the ground with surprising strength. Over them stood the happy mask salesman, announcing that he had a new mask that he wanted me to try. 
In his spastic, sudden movements matching his in-game appearance, he took out a mask modeled off someone's face that I couldn't recognize, a younger looking face, and handed it to the moon children. Giggling, they latched it to my face, their horrible broken bodies bouncing up and down. Two of them held me down while the other two began to sew the mask onto my face. My shrieks and screams caused the happy mask salesman's face to turn into the most horrific smile I'd ever seen. He sporadically moved around, examining this procedure like a curious doctor in that impossible movement. I flailed around, but it was of no use. My eyes rolled in the back of my head because of the pain. It felt so real, but I couldn't wake up. I couldn't wake up no matter how hard I tried to wake up. After the mask was melted onto my flesh, they began sewing my legs together, then my arms. The horrific feeling of a needle puncturing your legs and pulling them in. Rupturing your Achilles tendon and tying them together resonated throughout my entire body. I tried to scream, but the mask was pressed so tightly against my face that it was my new face. And my new face had no mouth. I didn't make a sound. I tried telling myself in my head that I was dreaming. I tried telling myself again and again. And suddenly the moon children stopped and looked at me. They just stared. And the happy mask salesman slowly bent down and stared at me, inches away from my face. And grinned when he simply said, You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Before the moon children suddenly resumed with increased vigor. I couldn't wake up. I couldn't wake up. It wouldn't let me wake up until they had crafted me into another elegy statue. This whole section was part of his original summary, but was censored by Ben for unknown reasons. Ben had actually started communicating with Jaduceable through the AI chat website Cleverbot. These conversations were mostly back and forth, asking why he was doing what he was doing. There's also a section where he starts to believe that the entity calling itself Ben might not be the actual Ben that had drowned. He suspected it might be a different entity altogether. The end of the document goes over another video summary for Matt.wmv. Matt is actually just the first part of the deducible video. The two used to be one, but were split into two, it seems, by the roommate. This mention of the father is something that we first heard in the Rosa video. Who could this be referring to? Why was there such an emphasis on them? That's twice now that they've been mentioned, so they must be someone to keep in mind for later. Jaduceable then notes a summary, was uploaded for a video titled children.wmv, only this video doesn't exist. This video was never uploaded to the YouTube channel and neither was the summary for it. Lastly, it is mentioned that Jaduceable doesn't have a roommate. He lived alone in the student dorms. He wished he did have someone, but no, he was all alone. He takes the cartridge and flees, with a plan to burn it and then the laptop next. There's a lot to unpack in this note, but the most important part is a hidden message. In the text, you can see believe written incorrectly three times. Each time a different letter is made capital as well. It spells out lie. The note was tampered with. In actuality, it was the entity that had sent the file out and changed it from a .txt file to an RTF file. It seems to have wanted to spread itself through the note. Now it can haunt whoever downloads the file. This was confirmed with the upload of a new video titled free.wmv. That is the ending of the first arc of Ben Drowned. It is often the most fondly looked upon portion. Most people remember the haunted game cartridge, but aren't aware of what comes afterwards. When talking with my peers even, most of them know what Ben Drowned is. They know the first part. They remember the ripples it sent through the creepypasta community. For many, this is where the story ends. It isn't the end though. The second arc, The Moon Children, followed closely behind. The Moon Children is where the story takes on its true form. It was never meant to be just a creepypasta. No. Ben Drowned was created to be an ARG. This was the arc that really showed how this story was going to play out. With Ben escaping into the internet fully, there were a few things that started popping up on the Jaduceable YouTube channel. Mainly there were these ciphers that when decrypted would lead to the next location for this story. The first cipher read, 
We all wear a mask sometimes. Keep your eyes peeled. Mother, I wonder what it is you whisper. For dusk, tonight, good luck. The rest of the ciphers were put together to lead to an old forum. The old forum led to the most important clues to start the ARG. The .NET structure and the phrase, you shouldn't have done that. When combined, they led to the website, you shouldn't have done that .NET. The appearance of this website led to a cult called the Moon Children. This is the main hub for the ARG in this arc. The website looked like one you might find hidden on the deep web. It had many pieces to look through, but sadly is no longer available. The website is entirely gone, so we can't go looking through the posts and piece it all together ourselves. Instead, we have screenshots, old Wayback Machine grabs, and some fan recreations. The website was mainly used by cult members to hold discussions and communicate with one another. The main website has links labeled Home, Creed, About, theories, contact us, the truth, and search. We also learned that the website was created by the cult back in 1998. The different links were pretty standard, but they are worth looking into. Starting with the theories tab, which had different theories about how the world would end. They had the Mayan calendar theory about 2012 and a few others, but there seemed to be a new one. This was the moon children's own theory about the world ending. This theory was called the Luna prophecy. It reads, Dating back to 1998, a moon child named Kelbris received several whispers from Luna herself. The Order was still young then, and Kelbris was the first member to have been talked to by her. Rather than ascending him, however, these whispers informed him of how the end will come. The whispers were brief and vague, detailed below. They, unintelligible, break free of the prison, engulf the world. Man will be betrayed by its minions, and I will be brought down from the sky, consuming everything. It's worth noting that the number three is reported by Kelbris to have been said numerous times, sometimes in between words, sometimes even between letters, so it's assumed that there is some kind of significance there. Kelbris was later found electrocuted. Whether it was foul play or an ascension was never determined. Although transcended, Kelbris's discovery has made him a legendary figure within the Moon Children, and much of the order today is based off of that prophecy. I mentioned Ascension earlier, and this would be a good time to go over what that means to the cult. From the myriad of context clues, it sounds like Ascension means to die. They die in order to ascend in their cult, and every member of the cult is awaiting their day they are chosen to ascend. The person that chooses who ascends is the deity, Luna, but how she picks appears to be unknown. Another tab named The Truth was password protected and was actually never seen during the ARG. Each piece was time sensitive, and this is one that was never solved. Important names that we've seen on the site so far are Ifri, Necro, Rosa, Ben, Kelbris, Alex, and someone by the name of Mr. D. Most likely the name of the site admin, Drowned. Drowned had a message on the site that simply said, you shouldn't be reading this. The admin had an icon of the Elegy Link statue. Ifri, Necro, Duskworld23, and Insidii are the active moderators of the website. Each of them has a page with their real names, likes, dislikes, and ambitions. Also, the name Rosa is mentioned in a special thanks list. Wait, is this Rosa the same as the one seen in the earlier Vampire the Masquerade video? Maybe just an allusion to her. It is really interesting that two characters would have the same name in this ARG and not share a connection. Going back to the website, it had many different connections to the Majora's Mask game. The cult was called the Moon Children. The different banners were all related to the areas found in the game, and there was a small graphic of Majora's Mask itself. Yet, every person in the forum acted like they had no connection to the game whatsoever. An important event that is referenced repeatedly on the website is the Blackout. Everyone was talking about what happened after their first sight went down during a Blackout. During the Blackout, a character named Alex was reported missing by other members of the cult. Looking deeper, you'll find that Alex, who used to be a member of the cult, now fights back against them for unknown reasons. If you search for a contact page for Ben, you'll be met with this banner that says, You have to warn them. Along with the banner is a timer that is counting down. It is counting down to the fourth day. This is something we'll come back to later. You shouldn't have done that.net also seems to be a website that is attempting to attract new members. There's a section where the mods talk about it, but also there's a place for users to send in their information for a chance to join the cult. 
They appear to be very selective, but exactly what they're looking for in a potential member is unknown. With two hours to go until the clock reached the end, an email was obtained from Ifrit's contact page. This is when players started to send him questions in hopes of figuring out what exactly was going on. The email belonged to a man named Matt Hubris, which was a different name than what was on Ifrit's profile. There are quite a few chat logs, but let me just share the pertinent information. It was discovered through back and forth emails that Ben was a member of the cult who had ascended. His body, notably, was never found though. Ben was also referred to as Matt's brother, but that was most likely a cult thing. Rosa was also mentioned as being his sister, which might fall under the same meaning. As the last hour neared, players wouldn't receive correspondence from Ifrit. They would get a single message that said he had heard someone knocking on his door. Following that, there was nothing. The account had gone silent. Just before the counter reached zero, there was a response video posted to free. This video was posted by a channel titled The Link Missing. The account was owned by someone named Alex, the same one mentioned before. The video had adult Link in Ocarina of Time playing the Song of Time in front of the moon. This shut down the You Shouldn't Have Done That website. When it came back up, players found out that it had been sent back in time. They had just discovered the main gameplay loop of the ARG. The site could be reset back to the first day in the same way that the video game could. This was a gift from Alex, who had just sent the players into the second cycle. Starting the second cycle, players immediately noticed that Ifrit was gone. He had been wiped from the site. When trying to access his About Us page, all that would greet you would be three effigy statues with the text, expecting to find someone else. This was accompanied by the school kids laugh on repeat. Something happened to Ifrit, something that players would need to find out. The first major breakthrough of the second cycle was when a player played the new wave bossa nova. This song brought back the Matt Hubris email, but it wasn't Matt on the other end. This time the person said they were Rosa. Rosa was worried about Matt and hadn't seen him since the blackout. Just like with Ben. The final thing she mentions is hearing it counting down outside of her door. There were a ton of songs being tried with different effects on the game. This would continue with the Song of Healing and the song that summons the four giants, the Oath to Order. These would have varying effects that I'll get to later because the game was being reset again when a player uploaded the Song of Time again in an attempt to save Rosa. The attempt was met with trepidation, but it was soon made clear what happened. Four new tags were added to the Rosa video. You didn't save her. Just like with Matt, they were unable to save another person. This wasn't the end of the bad news either. A video was uploaded to the Link Missing YouTube channel showing Link had been slain by Shadow Link. This happened because the players tried to play the Oath to Order without the proper tools needed. This led to the death of Alex as well. All wasn't lost as another player uploaded a video of Link reviving with a fairy and this was accepted. Alex was brought back to life, which leads directly into him disappearing after another song was played, the Sonata of Awakening. The game continued with a torrent of files being discovered hidden on the website. None of them are required for this story and just add a bit of world building. The files included images, sound files, and music files that could be heard when navigating the website. The story picked back up after a short hiatus with a new website within Hubris. This was a forum with a lot of hidden messages and areas to explore. This site also gives the biggest clue to what actually is happening in the ARG. On the forums, you can find members that had previously ascended. This includes Rosa and Neko. There's also some signs hinting to Rosa being trapped somewhere. And this is effectively where Arc 2 ends. The game was becoming too hard for the creator, Alex, to run. The community was running rampant on the first website. Also, he was trying to make a real game to be what users would interact with for the third and final arc. That game would never come out due to several issues surrounding its creation. This is where the story ended for many. The year was 2012 and a few canceled projects really halted the story to a standstill. The audience was eagerly waiting for the game or the movie or something else to look for on the Within Hebrews website, but it all seemed unlikely. With that, the project once again went on hiatus, but that wouldn't be the end of the story. Eight years later, on March 17th of 2020, the story would return in full, this time with a lot more to show. A 
a new video appeared on the Jaduzable YouTube channel titled Awakening.txt. This video seems to suggest that multiple timelines are merging together, that somehow time is acting differently and the world is heading towards the worst timeline possible. The end of the video talks about Awakening and says that it's coming. The story for this arc would be told in a little bit more of a straightforward way. The YouTube channel was being utilized way more and there would be a video for everything we needed to see. Of course, there was still plenty of hidden lore that can be found through the different codes and new website. After the video, Hubris.wmv would be the next video to premiere on the channel. It was a wall of text being written against a backdrop of a destroyed house. The text appears to be talking about human complacency and how the world around us is taken for granted. That the world had changed and we were incredibly unprepared for it. The video then cuts to the gameplay of Majora's Mask. The game is corrupted, more than usual. It shows Link looking at what appears to be a mirrored version of Termina. The screen then cuts to the file selection screen and a new file named End. The next video uploaded was end.wmv. In the video, there's another section of text against the destroyed room. Here the person explains that the world seems to be in the end times. It appears to be on the brink of collapse and that an apocalypse has started. There are sections of intermixed Majora's Mask footage throughout. The most notable part of the video starts after. The person typing up these notes is named Jadis. This is where the Awakening arc really begins. The next upload was Transmission. In the video, Jadis and his friend named Denton were looking for a man named Berkeley. Now it's important to note that due to the state of the world they live in, none of them were using their real names. Everyone in the timeline instead used pseudonyms that they chose. When they find Berkeley, he is squatting in some destroyed home. When confronted, the man talks as if he isn't really there. Berkeley then gives up his real name, Tyler Lawman, the same Tyler that went with Jaduceable to see the old man in Arc 1. In this world, if you give up your real name, that means you're either going to kill those that know it or yourself. This put everyone immediately on edge and guns were pulled. Denton then tries to reason with the man, saying they had a group that could help him. He doesn't seem to take notice. The man then asks Jadis for his real name, which he doesn't give. This causes Tyler to laugh and go on a rant. He explains that the world is all a product of his mind. That somehow he had created this apocalyptic world through his thoughts. That when he died, everyone was going with him. After a brief bit of talking, Tyler elects to take his own life. The two were unsuccessful in saving him. He was beyond their capabilities. The next video had a spectrogram code, like many of the others in this arc, and revealed binary code. When that was decoded, it led to a single question. What happened in 2012? The video seems like one we've seen before, but it ends in a very important way. It shows Link finding that the Happy Mask Salesman, Epona, Skull Kid, and Elegy Statue are all in Termina Field. The ocarina is pulled out and the video ends with Link standing ready to play a song. This implies that this again is what players must do to play the game. This is where the story sort of starts to take on a different tone than the previous arcs. Even so, we are introduced to our new website and the hub for the story, MethodsOfRevolution.com, which is also the site for the movie that never came out. It hadn't received updates since 2012, but now there were some new blog posts stated to have come out in 2013. This website also posted that question of what happened in 2012. It also was going to give us the answer. More importantly to the game though, it would have the polls that players would vote on in order to progress the game. There are some rather interesting pieces to be found on the website. The first was a series of chat logs between users whose names had been purposely covered up. Scrubbing through each of these chats, these users would appear to be members of the old website, those that had ascended. The number of letters that are covered up perfectly matched to those that had ascended, including Duskworld23, Neko, and Insidii, the latter being mentioned by name. They're talking about being homesick, which doesn't really make sense, since they are supposed to be dead and all. They seem to be referring to the timeline syncing up. The convergence of whatever happened to the world in 2012 that differed from our own world. We'll come back to what I think that means later. The Sonata of Awakening was chosen in the community poll. The next video that was scheduled to be released was called Sonata. It would release not long after the poll. The video showed Link playing the Sonata of Awakening and literally ascending into the sky. As he does so, images would flash on screen and briefly, a video of a man in a gas mask.
The next video is king.txt, which comes from Jadis. Jadis talks about how the old world used to feel like a chore for him, and that somehow he is finding his place in the new one. He talks about how he's starting to see weird coincidences in his day-to-day -day life, repeating numbers and signs were a few of the examples he gave. The video ends with him making a similar reference to an earlier video, saying that his forehead was tingling and that he is being guided by something. A new video was getting ready to be posted and it was one that the community had been waiting years for. Children.wmv was finally going to be shown to the world. In the first arc of Ben Drowned, there was a video summary that Jaduzable finds but doesn't remember writing or even recording. Could this be that exact video? The video appears to show what would happen if an alternate decision was made during the Gateway video. This one has some very interesting imagery of Link walking around a corrupted clock town, seeing a giant Deku scrub, seeing the Elegy statue or Ben, and finally running into this guy, an NPC from Ocarina of Time that ran the potion shop. The happy mask salesman's laugh can be heard and then it cuts to black. A face then appears on screen with the words, you shouldn't have done that. A new link was found on the Methods of Revolution website. This one led to a file called the real truth.rtf, which appeared to be an altered version of the file that was discovered in part one. The file is relatively similar, but changes all of the instances of Ben to Ben with all caps. There's also a new entry for September 10th at 9.09 PM. This entry seems to be talking about Jaduceable. It calls him weak, greedy, and pathetic, but also vulnerable and alone. Quoting it, these messages are not meant for them to read right now. None of it will make sense to either this desperate puppet or his audience at present. Conclusion, it is a wasted effort. Regrettably, in order to achieve fulfillment and ascend higher, we will need to wait for some time. We will continue to form our own consensus. But there's too much of a commotion here. That blithering idiot could set us back if we are discovered. Then patience is the answer. Time is inconsequential here. He attempting to interface with our world again. Moon and the sun. Show ourselves to him. Show that we are many and we are watching. Is it time? That has a high probability of completely fracturing his already weakened mind. Yes. Yes, this one will die soon. Yes, this world is beginning to fall apart as well. Yes, but on that matter, it is a debate. Our ability to interact with their plane is limited to only a few methods. Yes, but it will be that way forever. Yes, but the probability that we become incompatible is too great if we wait too long. Yes, we have a proposal to change it. It will take years, but that is acceptable. Yes, that is fine. Deleted. Yes, but they should know the truth at some point. Yes, but only when it is too late. Following this, another poll was posted and voting began. The options were run, fight, and hide. After a close vote, the poll ended with this image and the option for hide just barely winning out. The next video is from Jadis again and was called 2018.txt. This video talks about how his life was before the collapse of society. He had just bought a house, was married, and happy. But really, he always felt like something was missing. He never quite felt fulfilled. He laments that he's pretty lucky where he is now. The next video was Kelbris. This video was set to premiere, but had a few changes before it could. Firstly, the title and tags were changing throughout, with the video title landing on the father. More importantly, the description of the video changed to say this. They don't need to see this. Stop uploading this. He is already dead. This doesn't matter. They don't need to see this. This was a binary code that translated to the last missing video, also found in the description. This video showed what happened next in the deducible video. The names of the files start with the link and map files, but when the game resets, there's a new file titled children with no secondary file. Selecting children, the game starts with an ominous line of text. You're almost at the end of the world. The game loads in with Link staring at the potion seller NPC from before. The world is in absolute ruin with missing textures everywhere and a strange noise. Link leaves the town and before the game resets, a new text is shown. Stop exploring before it is too late. You're going to wake him up. When the file select screen comes back up, children and stop are the two files. The second file is deleted and children is selected. Link is now in an empty room for a moment before falling into the room of the giants. Here he is told, you are digging too deep, turn back now. 
The game resets again, and this time the second file says please. The game once again loads in with a message, everything is deconstructing. Link is in the void, and before him is a Zora playing a song on the piano. As he continues, he runs into two more Zora. Macau and Lulu from the game. Macau is on the ground, and crying can be heard, but I'm not sure if it's from Lulu or not. Link continues his path until he comes across this. I'll let this play out. This is the father and Judiciable seems to have found his end in the game. It was always hinted at, but never stated outright. Judiciable died, somehow this game had killed him, and he had ascended. But not of his own free will, like the others. This was an answer to a decades long question. What happened to Judiciable at the end of his playthrough of Majora? Well our answer is bittersweet, but something we all expected. A new poll was added to the Methods of Revolution site, this one titled, Awaken the second player. The only two choices were yes and no. This would be met with a yes on the poll. Before we get into that, there was another video being posted on the channel from Jadis titled Baker.txt. This was a conversation in a coffee shop between Jadis and his friend Baker. Baker was telling him that there was a riot that was going to happen in the city that night and that he needed to leave before a lockdown was put in place. There are allusions to the real world thrown all around within this video. With this being released in 2020, a lot of the lockdown, the virus, and riots were mentioned. They were all changed within the story and taken in a different direction, with a cure being stated to be some biblical mark of the beast type deal. The final line of the back and forth said, I'm telling you, whatever they end up proposing, don't get it put in you. The story was starting to sound like something had happened in 2012, turned into something also happening in the current time. That timeline had been hit multiple times by societal changes that had brought it all to near collapse. The next video we would get was titled Awakening, before being changed to Methods of Revolution Day 1. This video starts a shift into the end game of the Ben Drowned ARG. With this video, we'd be getting a different kind of series, one where every decision is likely to lead to an outcome that we can't come back from. The video starts with a man waking up in a dark room. Immediately he finds a flashlight and sees a sign that says, don't let him hear you. There are these creepy mannequin heads inside the room, which clearly looks like a hotel. Another note is found on the desk that says that time is wrong here. This is followed by the person saying that he hasn't eaten in 10 days, but that he hasn't had to. The final message is that he needs to stay silent. Someone is watching and listening. If he wants to survive, he just needs to follow that one rule. As the video continues, player two then hears breathing at the door and goes to check out the looking glass. What he sees is a man in a gas mask walking by. He stops momentarily and looks at the door directly. Player two pulls away and goes back into the room. After a short while, he finds a radio. Another man's voice can be heard speaking through it. I'll play this scene now. So, oh, I see you met the jailer on the first floor. Face to face. Sorry, where are my manners? You can call me Abel. Yeah, that's A-B-E-L. And if you think this is the confusing part, you really haven't seen anything yet. Listen, I'm gonna do you a favor. Don't worry about what day it is. Don't worry about what year it is. Don't even worry about what you used to know because it's not gonna help you here. You, my friend, are a completely blank slate. Wherever you thought you were, doesn't matter. It's gone. You're completely cut off from the outside world in what would best be described as a halfway house. You're on the first floor 
<laughs> surrounded by oblivion, and any attempts to leave via window or entryway result in immediate termination. So between you and me, it's not really the way to go. But it brings up the bigger question. Why even leave? You've got a grade here. We've got books to read. You've got a better chance to get in touch with God. We've got entertainment sets. As long as you stay away from the jailer, you shouldn't have any problem. At worst, there may be new arrivals that are not as quiet as you are and take some time to get used to the new location. <laughs> they happen from time to time, and it's unavoidable. <laughs> persist outside the usual time frame and continue to be a problem, we'll remove them no problem for you. Uh, there is a little bit of bad news. Um, you know, I regret to inform you that it looks like your friend, and I say friend, she's more like a predecessor, in your room and trying to communicate something with you before she trashed it. So, apart from delaying your entertainment set by a few days, um, sorry, it's not really quite the warm welcome we wanted for you. There's one thing she's right about, though. It's that, yeah, time and items in this world don't really have the same kind of permanence. But I wouldn't really look to her for, you know, role model examples. <laughs> Again, you know, I'm talking to you, but I'm also talking to you, because it's a misnomer to say that you yourself have been given free will again. A better way to describe it would be that you're awake and you're properly receiving. You know, I never tell any subjects this, because they always refuse to believe that they have anything less than free will and yada yada yada, but your case is a little bit of a special one. Your consciousness, believe it or not, is comprised of several hundred of those that participated in the original St. Louis incident. That is, <laughs> it's crazy, but also no offense, we do have a bit of a death pool going on how quickly you'll try and leave the room and die. Past history has shown they don't really like doing what they're told, and it's like they don't really value human life. They just like to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So, um, sorry to you, and, uh, uh, but, you know, if I were you, I would just stay and relax here. You really have nothing to worry about. You're totally safe here. You don't need to eat. You've taken care of all of that stuff for you. We've got your entertainment set up here once we clear out all this debris. And uh, you just need to sit back and relax and just enjoy the parameters we've established for you. This scene gives us a lot to think about. Player 2 was awakened based on the voting from the community. It seems that Abel is also referring to the community voting here with the polls. This is establishing the community as a player in the story again. Abel also mentions that someone was in the room before Player 2 awakened. The quick interference from Rosa near the end makes it seem like it might have been Rosa. Almost every video in this arc has had a special intro with some dialogue from Rosa. Could this be how she makes her way back into the story? Methods of Revolution Day 3 is the next video that goes live and we're introduced to a new person. Player 2 wakes up and immediately hears a woman screaming next door. She tries to get in contact by knocking on the door, which does get her attention. She continues yelling that she doesn't know where she is and she needs help. After rifling through the notebook, he finally ends up getting a marker and a free piece of paper to write a note. He tells her she needs to stop talking. She starts banging on his wall, asking for help, completely ignoring the note. Player 2 tries to find a way to calm her down, but the ominous breathing from before can be heard. Her door is opened and the jailer has arrived. The woman screams one more time before being silent. She has fallen victim to him. Two new polls hit the community. The first asked which items in this photo should the MC take with him when he tries to leave the room. The winning votes were the notepad, the pen, the flashlight, and a model head. The second poll went up a week later, and players were also warned that this decision made in this poll would directly affect the MC in some way and carried more weight than the other polls thus far. This means that this is where the community gets to decide how the story progresses. The poll question had eight options, and it was entirely up to the community to decide. The eight questions were related to when the MC should try and leave the room. The options were a day at a time. So one day to seven days. 
The final option was to stay, which would let the week pass by without leaving the room. The poll came to a close with day six, being chosen with the majority of the vote. The next video would be released and based on the vote from the community. Message of Revolution Day 6 was released and had Player 2 collecting his stuff before leaving the room. This is the first time that Player 2 and the community get to see the rest of the environment. The hallway is empty when he leaves, but the exit appears to be locked. He ends up finding a stairwell and ascending the building. The next floor is lit up by red lights giving it an ominous feeling. Player 2 pulls out his flashlight and starts looking around. The hall leads him to a bunch of discarded cardboard boxes. Further in, he finds another room with the number 206 on it, and enters it. The notes read, So many more voices up here. Is this my fault? Did I ask for this? Silenced my life away. There is one more note that says that someone is leaving and hopes that there are others. Player 2 walks up to the door and opens it slightly. Looking down the hall, he sees a dark figure moving. He quickly closes the door and locks it. He takes a seat as the sound of something moving by continues. Among the notes, a map was also found. This map appears to have been written by someone else trying to make their way through the building. It shows what rooms have either been explored or where they are located. The elevator clearly doesn't work and is marked out thusly. Another poll would go live, this time asking what time player two should leave this room. The poll was a little closer this time with 62 votes for day five and 44 votes to stay put. This would mean that they would be leaving the room again, five days from when they arrived. Methods of Revolution Day 11 is uploaded next, and immediately gets to the action. Player 2 grabs his stuff and leaves the new room. He makes it outside and hears the same motion as before, he closed the door. He turns and is immediately caught by the jailer and killed on the spot. A still frame of the father appears for a second before cutting to black. Day 14 goes across the screen and we are met with a new protagonist, Player 3. She wakes up in the same room that Player 2 had started in and starts to investigate her surroundings. While exploring the room, Abel comes over the radio. He goes on a similar tangent as before while explaining that this isn't the first person to die. Honestly though, I'm not really even sure why I even bother giving you the spiel. You people never seem to listen anyway. My name's Abel, but I wouldn't bother committing it to memory. I'm sure you'll have your own delusions of grandeur and wander off and die soon anyway. I'm telling you this right now, point blank. You can't leave. Any attempts to leave via window or entryway result in immediate termination. Your job is to just stay here and relax. You're here because you wanted to be. Everyone always seems to forget that. Listen, just don't bother trying to follow in his footsteps. He took a few items with him when he left, but fortunately, one of the things he took with him was exactly the thing that allowed him to figure out how to sneak past the jailer in the first place. Which is good, because that was kind of cheating. And without that, you absolutely have no chance in hell to figure out how he managed to escape. Which is for the best, really. Uh, that means you can stay alive and stay here. Unless you... Well, no, never mind. Uh, here's hoping that, you know, I'll be able to talk to you again. <laughs> I doubt it. She can't leave and is trapped in a limbo of sorts. She needs to just relax, because this was her choice to be here, but when they arrive, they always want to leave. Abel's words here allude to what the overall story of what's happening here. His words could mean a lot of things, but it appears that this place isn't just kidnapping people but rather they chose to be here and then somehow decide to leave once they arrive. This points to people that choose to arrive maybe feeling like they had no other option. The need to escape, even with the danger of the jailer, isn't enough to stop them from trying. The next community poll asks the same question as before, since the new gameplay loop was to decide how to safely traverse the hotel. Alex stated that this was possible for someone to explore the whole hotel, but that it was unlikely to be done with the first MC and that their death was almost inevitable. With that in mind, the community overwhelmingly voted to stay this time. The warning before was clear. It was hard to explore without being caught. The original idea was to follow the notes left in the Bible, but it was risky since they'd already killed one MC off. Due to waiting, the room now had been furnished. Player 3 wakes up and gets a call from Abel right away. 
she's been given that entertainment package that was promised to player two. Inside she finds a Nintendo 64 with a single controller and one game. She flips it over to reveal Majora on the cover. This is the exact same copy of the game that had started this whole rabbit hole. Jadusable had played this game and met his end. Now she was given the same opportunity. She loads the game up and names herself Sarah, which is the name we'll be using from now on. The game plays out as you'd expect until a new piece of dialogue is introduced. Sarah, that's a nice name. This is when players are introduced to the two major plot threads they can follow. The first is to explore the hotel and experience the world that Sarah is trapped in, to see what else the Ben storyline has to offer. The other option is to explore the game world, to figure out what exactly is haunting that cartridge. These options are time sensitive and need players to balance the two. Both options will have an ending worth the time investment. With that, the poll was put up. Either explore the haunted cartridge or explore the hotel. It wasn't even close on the vote as the former took 83%. This means that it's time to go back to Majora, back to Ben. The next video is titled Methods of Revolution, Ben. This video starts with Sarah in a new area. She's in a forest with a happy mask salesman dead on the ground. As she's examining his body, a corrupted version of the moon starts to shake the ground. As she's walking away, she falls through the ground and a familiar song can be heard in the background. A text box appears and someone calling themselves Ben is talking. They said they are safe here. This new place looks just like the ending cutscene from the game. The tree stump has all the faces seen during the end cutscene. Here Sarah is asked a question. Will she play a song for Ben? The video then cuts back to the hotel. Abel says that the game is acting weird and that he's going to reset it for her. He calls Ben a rogue AI that is trying to communicate with her. The screen shows Sarah sitting on the bed looking at the black screen, before going back to the game at the stump. Here are choices to be made by the community. Do they want Sarah to play a song for Ben, and if so, what song? The other option is to explore the hotel. Both of these polls were placed online and ready for the community. At the same time, another important piece of the puzzle was posted onto the Methods of Revolution website. It was discovered on the site's URL and contained another one of Jadis's journal entries. The journal entry gave the players another peek into the world that he existed in. Riots, unrest, a new virus called Heroes, this world had gone from a world-altering event to world-altering event. And here's where he talks about that coffee shop once again. A year prior, he had a talk with his friend Baker about leaving before something happened. This is what he was talking about. A riot began in Seattle, one that was started to bring a divide to the country. This was the event that Baker had told Jadis to leave before it had begun. Jadis laments the world he once knew, how he knew he wouldn't be able to use his phone in the new world, how he would get used to not having it. He decides that he will meet up with Baker as the world falls into chaos. There is a way out for him. Back in the game, the community had voted for Sarah to play the Song of Healing for Ben. She begins to explore her area before coming into contact with an elegy statue. She hides behind a tree and continues to look around before seeing that there are two elegy statues now.
Ben begins to speak to her. I've been trapped in here for so long, no one could ever find me. He's been using me for all this time. Tormenting me, and anyone who tries to intervene. Someone else came close years ago, but he was all by himself and the father had already gotten too strong. They made him another vessel. He could control our actions and our words. We have moments of free will. Important to note here, the wording for some of the text started and then erased itself. It said, I'm sorry, sometimes I don't know what I'm saying. This line has been heard at the start of every video since the start of Awakening. It is a line said by Rosa, so it can be assumed that this is Rosa talking to Sarah. There's a final plea, heal our souls, before Sarah is transported to a new area with a giant Deku scrub. Before this, there were scenes from Jaducible's playthrough. This is important to connect the original story, but really is a great callback to where this all began. Sarah gets turned into adult Link from Ocarina of Time and attacks the giant Deku scrub. After the screen cuts to black, she is brought back to the tree stump from before. She walks up to it and begins to play the Song of Time. This returns her to the first day. The NPCs are back and the moon is floating ominously in the sky. After Sarah is done with the game, Abel comes over the radio once again. I suppose that they weren't necessarily high, but <laughs> I was never expecting this. You know, I gotta give it to you, Sarah. I'm pretty impressed. I've never seen anyone do that before, ever. You know, time travel. I mean, I get it's a part of the game, you know, like back at that old original game, but you know, with what we've programmed into here, I, I mean, to go all the way back to 2010 like that, that is, huh. That I, I am still trying to wrap my head around. I'm sure you are too, and I, hell, I'm sure you're probably more lost than anyone, but us of us keeping score back home, like, the fact that the Ben character had deviated so much from his original programming. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna geek out here a little bit. Like, this is incredible. You know, I couldn't do that myself. I'm glad you're here. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm sorry. So I know I'm probably speaking a mile a minute, and I'm, I'm going to try and give you a little bit of context here. Um, in, in layman's terms, this was kind of one of the original simulations that we had constructed way, way back when. A kind of a playground, if you would, for our first real rudimentary foray into artificial intelligence. You know, granted, that was so long ago that it looks absolutely archaic uh, compared to what we could do now. But it's been a blast going down memory lane. It's like, it's like almost like an ant colony that you just you set and you forgot about it for decades, and then to revisit it, to find it so completely messed up and destroyed, it's 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 it's, it's wild. Like with its program and directive to to corrupt as much as it could, and when no other external force was involved, it just turned inward on itself and and destroyed the own world that it inhabited. I mean, you saw it for yourself. Like, normally you load in, there's the, that intro with a bunch, a bunch of boring exposition, and but there was none of that. All that remained of that entire world was just two holdout areas. One of infinite corruption, and the other of this weird, almost sanctuary, where the last few AIs that existed in this game had kind of banded together as a sort of safe zone. It, I am sorry, I gotta go back over this again and relook at this, but this is incredible. <laughs> I mean, it, it's incredible how just self aware that Ben character was. He evolved like completely from his original directive. You know, to give you a little bit of context, like you, the name Ben, you know, we, we kind of coined this entire system as a little bit of a tribute because he was the first person that we managed to digitize completely into this system into this behavioral event network. But his consciousness was always supposed to be just incredibly limited, you know, meant to follow the same kind of parameters that any other normal NPC in that program would follow. I mean, I wonder if there was some kind of event 
or, or some kind of trigger that made him suddenly deviate from his parameters into some kind of being almost with rudimentary self-awareness. Or, you know, maybe we just didn't program it right. I mean, this was, what, decades ago, right? <laughs> it was a new science back then. I mean, the, the implications of this are incredible. It means that there are actors in the worlds we make that are capable of realizing that they are in some sort of simulation. I mean, this is, this is big. This is huge. And to think back, it, it, one of the first experiments we did into this had an anomaly that did that. I'm just, I'm just so interested that the something had the wherewithal to have the capacity to further break the logic of the game to send you back in time, far beyond the normal parameters of what that song would do. I mean, you've actually gone back into a world before this all went to hell. I mean, look at it. Like, the world, you know, except for you being there, it seems completely back to normal. Except, you know, now we, we both know what's going to happen eventually. You know, given enough time, the father's going to corrupt everything again. But it's, it's so wild. Like, I mean, that was sentience that we just saw, right? But anyway, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Like, thankfully, it's only just a game, right? These are just programs talking to each other. They can't actually think or feel like we can. Uh, so... You know, it's, it's an interesting experiment, and I for sure will delve into this more, but your role in this is finished. So it's not really worth getting more into at all. Um, I have a ton of other stuff I can show you, if you'd like. Our technology, believe me, <laughs> this is a game from the early 2000s. I have stuff that it's going to blow your mind when you find out about it. <laughs> We're still working out some kinks and a few things, but I'd love to show you some more stuff. And why don't you stick around for a little bit? You know, I'll show you what else we've got. But don't worry about touching this and going back to this for right now. Uh, it's not really important. Because even though it's, it's traveled back in time in the, in the world there, it's very much isolated to that world. I mean, clearly, we're still having this conversation. You're still stuck here. <laughs> and uh, nothing else has changed in the real world. But, man, I've got to look into that. Why don't you hang tight for a little bit? Don't mess with that anymore. I'm going to come by and pick up this cartridge soon, okay? All right. Abel has just confirmed a few rumors that have been going on within the community since the start. For starters, Ben was a boy who was digitized into a machine learning network called Ben, or Behavioral Environment Network. He somehow was able to retain some of his sentience. This ends with Abel telling Sarah that she doesn't need to play the game anymore. Her job is done. Now he will need to come and get the game. He also asserts that she shouldn't play the game anymore. This leads to the next community poll. Here players get to decide if they want to continue playing the game, wait in the room for Abel, or escape the room. The three options all seem to have varying paths that could take the story in wildly different directions. The decision was made to continue playing the game. Sarah jumps back into the game and continues in Clock Down. She has the adult Link mask in her inventory. After exploring the town for a bit, she ends up meeting a familiar face inside the clock tower. This is Ifrit, the one that was met before in part two. He explains that the inhabitants of this world are all people or used to be. They were digitized and then programmed to act the way the characters in the game would. This left them in a perpetual loop as the days were reset game after game. The NPCs weren't the only people that got digitized. The worst one by far was Ben, who was trapped in the Elegy statue. He was unable to move freely, but fully capable of seeing everything going on around him. He was trapped in this prison, exploited for his love of the game. Sarah decides she must defeat the father within the game in order to save the NPCs trapped inside. As if on cue, the father sends enemies to confront her. She goes and quickly dispatches of them. This leads to the next choice on the community poll. This poll asks players where they should go in the game. The decision was close, but eventually the stockpot in slash explore clock town entry won out. The next video starts with Sarah exploring Clockdown, before going to the Stockpot Inn and encountering a moon child. The game forcibly kicks her from the game, and when she comes back, the town is full of the undead. Going back to the inn, she finds a heart piece, and is told she needs to collect the rest of the moon children's hearts in order to save everyone. This then takes Sarah to Romani Ranch. 
where she encounters Gomez, the Reaper. Not able to defeat him, she retreats into the barn and is met with Romani. Romani turns out it's actually Rosa, the same Rosa who has been mentioned several times throughout the story. She is now free thanks to Sarah. Rosa thanks her and gives her two important items, the light arrows and a memory pendant. The light arrows are to help her defeat Gomez outside. The pendant, however, serves a special purpose. It has the ability to return the memories to certain NPCs and give them autonomy. Sarah runs outside and continues her fight with the Reaper. It doesn't take long before she comes out victorious. The next video poll went up and asked where everyone wanted to go. By one vote, the Great Bay Coast was chosen. Of course, without Epona, it was impossible to get there, since the Adult Link mask couldn't be removed. It meant she couldn't ride her horse. This led to the second option being decided upon, which was Snowhead Mountains. Before leaving, Rosa tells Sarah of what happened in this world. Originally, it was supposed to be a never-ending playground for people to explore and play forever. Her and other kids were digitized into the game with this promise in mind. Something went awry, and she ended up trapped in an internal loop of having her mind erased at the end of every day. This line does hint at there being multiple people that had been digitized into the game. Sarah makes her way for Snowhead and goes through Clockdown first. The town is now empty, save for one NPC walking through the rain and silence. Sarah follows her to the pool and finds the body of the Happy Mask salesman floating in the water, not moving. Sarah flees the town and runs into another enemy from the game. She quickly dispatches of him and continues toward Snowhead. At this time, she's also joined by her fairy, who is named Circle. They regained their memories through the use of the pendant. In Snowhead, she encounters the Moonchild, Goat, and is transported into a boss fight with the Goat enemy. The fight is a harder one than all the others, but with little help from Rosa, she's able to overcome. When the battle ends, she is taken to a floating platform and facing the Moonchild once again. He chastises her before telling her to go ahead and consume him already. Sarah gets the heart and continues her quest towards the Great Bay Coast. The game has been deteriorating this entire time and has even hit the Great Bay Coast. The water of the coast is completely gone, allowing Sarah to walk along the ocean floor. This is where she finds the next Moonchild and boss. The encounter proves to be just a time waster as the Moonchild made himself invincible and intends to just waste Sarah's time until the moon falls. Sarah is able to escape the encounter but then runs into someone that had been mentioned before. There was a Goron that mentions another person also running around this game. This person is encountered at the end of the video by Sarah. The person takes off their Zora mask and reveals they are also Link. This is Jaducible, and he has been digitized into the game. Somehow he is able to regain full autonomy and wants to stop Sarah from completing the fourth day glitch. The two end up fighting, but Jaducible has the Fierce Deity mask. The fight is incredibly hard for Sarah to win, and in the end, she dies by a final blow from Jaducible. At this time, a new website was also discovered. Here is the answer to most of the community's questions. The website is the Eternity Project. This is the video that stands as an introduction to the project. A famous doctor once said that suffering can lead to transformation and that out of ashes births a phoenix. We believe humanity has a greater destiny, not one that was meant for a life of living in perpetual debt in a world full of poverty, violence, and corruption. At the Eternity Project, we set out with a mission to help alleviate the suffering and give us, all of us, a chance to prosper as we were always destined to. In the early 2000s, development of this technology began, and our team at Xavius Solutions has spent the last two decades working tirelessly with our research and development teams to ensure the safety and longevity of the project before making it commercially available. In 2020, we are proud to announce that the Eternity Project has passed its final preliminary test and is ready for the general public. There is no age requirement to join, no financial obligation, no discrimination of any kind, although priority treatment is given to those who are approaching end of life. Once a part of the Eternity Project, you and your loved ones can enjoy a carefree existence experiencing new joys in the various worlds we've designed. Here, you can live without fear of pain or death. You can take on any role, be the hero of your favorite movie, rescue the princess from an evil dragon, 
relive your childhood through some of your favorite video games. Or if you want the more traditional experience of an afterlife, you can enjoy your own simulated version of heaven catered to your generalized denomination. Our dedicated team is always ensuring the proper safety and management of our worlds with multiple backups. Keep in mind that the number and fidelity of the available worlds for our patients is increasing with each and every passing year. So if your perfect world doesn't currently exist, well, it just might tomorrow. So how does it work? It starts with a simple procedure on the patient's left hand. Here, we'll be able to test if your body is compatible with our augmented technology. If the implant isn't rejected by the body, you will then be assigned to a personalized physician to discuss what manner of care is best for you and what world you might be best suited for initially. Keep in mind, this is only a starting point. You can move between different worlds to meet up with friends and family at your leisure. Next, you'll be able to schedule a series of appointments at one of your local health care centers for your digitization process. In these appointments, we get to know you a little bit better by administering personalized tests on different attributes, ranging from cognition, perception, negative triggers, favorite memories, political beliefs, and more. The goal is to create a complete personality file on you leading up to your actual digitization. Why? Because each one of us is a unique and wonderful human being, we go through extraordinary lengths to ensure that the digitization process captures every essence of what makes you, well, you. Once digitized, you'll be able to enjoy your newfound freedom You've become part of a world where anything is possible, and you have eternity to enjoy it. So join us on our endeavor to connect the world in perfect harmony. For a millennia, humanity has always lived in the shadow of our greatest enemy, death. But now, there is no reason to fear it. We have created eternity. This is the Eternity Project website, the one mentioned in the video, but there was actually a version before. This version very clearly is composed of the group that existed in the Moon Children arc. Quote, This is a website for those that have formed a spiritual connection with the Moon and Him and recognize that we have been selected to perform miracles and bring enlightenment into this world. She has chosen us and only us to survive the upcoming apocalypse because we have honored her and devoted ourselves to her. As we work to enforce her will, we grow together as a family and serve the greater good. We are the Moon's children. This comes from the homepage of the Legacy website, and this would change as the group gained some mainstream appeal. This section comes directly from their About page. The Moon Children was one of the first iterations of the Eternity Project, originally founded by the moniker Kelbris in 1998. While not our organization's real name, the website operated under the guise of a cult worshipping a lunar goddess. This was specifically marketed towards disenfranchised and outcasted youths searching for a home. Our development team leaned into the supernatural aspects of the foundation of this pseudo-cult as it took advantage of the naivety, sense of magical wonderment, and intrinsic desire for belonging of these children. Having not yet been jaded by the realities of adulthood, it is not too dissimilar from the current fervor surrounding Eternity Project. Only now the results are actually tangible and have decades of testing behind them. At the time, current science believed, through much trial and error, that the only possible way to achieve a successful ascension was through a child applicant. They were believed to possess enough purity to be able to have a strong enough spiritual release to be able to successfully ascend. As such, the project initially drew applicants from a pool of adolescents that had weak familial ties. Ones whose disappearances would not draw a widespread and lengthy manhunt. This hypothesis was later debunked as advancements continued in the field, eventually proving that with the proper preparations and team, there are not nearly as many obstacles that interfere with an individual's ability to ascend. We will always honor the human cost it took us to get here. The entirety of the Moon Children arc is paying off here. The cult was actually just this group called the Eternity Project. They are working on a project that could take a person's consciousness, 
and upload it into anything. This is where Ben comes from, Rosa, and all the others. There were children that were exploited for testing of the project. This is also what is meant to ascend. You were leaving this world behind, literally, and going to another one. The project would prove successful and now fully capable of uploading a person into it. They even updated their old website, out with the cult and in with the scientists and healthcare professionals. This shift was needed and likely led to more and more people signing up. This also helps to explain the hotel. The hotel up to this point had been an anomaly, but it is likely the waiting area for those that have given their bodies up to the project. Here they will be held until they can be uploaded into whatever world the group decides for them. This is why they never needed to eat, but they also weren't allowed to leave. There are also these voicemails from Abel to an unknown person. He's explaining that he is running a PR campaign to fix some issues a recent video from the Eternity Project had caused. The issue was that the project released a video that claimed it could recreate heaven for you, which caused issues all the way up to the Pope. In these voicemails, he's asking someone to go into the code of World Alpha. World Alpha is what their entire system is based off the code of. They need to make some changes, as there is something hiding in the world that Abel considers skeletons in the company's closet. The person that he is likely speaking to is Jadis, who hasn't been mentioned at all since the riot.txt was discovered. The final voicemail was Abel explaining how to change the heart of World Alpha. This needed to be done for some reason that he doesn't specify. It was super important though. This is more important to the story as this allowed the community to tamper with the game and bring Sarah back to life with a fairy. Now alive again, Sarah wakes up in the bowels of Clock Tower. She is a kid again, since Deducible stole her adult Link mask. She makes her way up the stairs and is greeted by a circle. The world is falling apart and something weird is happening with the moon, she's told. When she goes out into Clock Town, the moon is massive and even blinks at her. After exploring the town for a bit, she ends up in a room with all the NPCs of World Alpha. They are arguing about whether to do the fourth day glitch and bring the world to an end or let the moon crash and reset it once again. The NPCs are arguing for a while about this, and this leaves Sarah in a tight spot. If she does the fourth day glitch, she could break the world forever. If she doesn't, they will be trapped in here with the father forever. The final decision was made by the players in a final poll. With a 91% of the vote, it was decided that the fourth day glitch would be done. This was the final decision in the final chapter of the Ben Drowned ARG. The final video, The End, was uploaded and immediately started with Sarah performing the glitch in the observatory. Sarah runs down to the town to see what's changed and only finds Matt standing over the dead body of the happy mask salesman. Matt explains that this was his plan all along. He serves the father and he wanted the world to be thrust into chaos so that the father could recreate it. He tells Sarah that everyone has died and it's because of the fourth day glitch. There's some crazy dark imagery here as a happy mask salesman is thrown up on a pike and set alight. There are these people all bowing to the burning man. There appears to be a cult built around worshipping the father. Sarah runs into the clock tower and descends the stairs to find Jaducible in a twisted version of the elegy statue that happens to be Ben. Here Sarah actually talks to Jaducible. Her words appear on screen. Jaducible says that he was trying to keep this place safe from people like her. She wasn't meant to be a hero and just like the others before her, he had planned to kill her and protect the inhabitants. This is why he had to kill her before. Deducible decides that the only way to end this is with Sarah's help. He sacrifices himself to give her a new weapon and armor. She heads into the next room and is met with Matt and a moonchild in the Majora's mask. A battle takes place between Majora and Sarah. She's able to land a debilitating hit and pulls out her ocarina. She plays a song of healing and something big starts moving towards them. Majora dies and the camera pans over to Matt who says, you shouldn't have done that. Matt is consumed by static with a scream and the scene changes. Before Sarah is the father. He takes up the entire screen and stares with unblinking eyes. Sarah and the father begin to talk. She explains how this world is on the brink of destruction and how he is the cause of it. The father says that he is doing this because it is what the world demanded of him. Sarah continues by saying this world was created by the unrefined ascension process and that the inhabitants of this world are mostly children who ascended against their will. The father thinks before asking if they wish to change his parameters. They ask him to instead protect the people of World Alpha. He agrees, but says that he would have to eliminate all anomalies. This includes Sarah herself and Circle. 
the pair asks if the inhabitants will remember them. The father says that the trauma they have undergone is going to need to be reset, so likely not. A final question is asked, what will happen to them and where will they go? The father says that he does not know. The video cuts to static and it ends with credits. After the credits roll, the elegy statue and Link are waving at the screen. Ben is waving goodbye and thanking you for returning his world to its natural order. This is the end of the ARG that started life back in 2009. It's kind of a bittersweet feeling going through this all. Ben Drowned was my first ever gaming creepypasta, the one that brought me into this world, into this genre of entertainment. It's actually responsible for me being a YouTuber right now. The story ends with a rather happy note. The game and everyone inside of it are able to happily live their eternity. What started with the haunted Majora's Mask cartridge has now turned into a story of children being murdered and uploaded into a game for experimental reasons. The world of Ben Drowned was one that I was completely enthralled with when it first came out. The story I feel is all encompassing of what a gaming creepypasta ARG should be. It had a realistic intro that escalated into clues and hints of what was actually going on. Then a cult and a real world ending theories were discussed before finally coming back to the game and showing us what happened to our original protagonist. I think there's a lot more to this world than what we've seen. The Eternity Project is still a relative unknown. There's so much to go through on their site, but their true motives are never really shown. And that's likely for the best. A little bit of ambiguity could leave the door open to another project from Alex Hall. He has an incredible knack for this kind of storytelling. I can't wait to see what he comes up with next. I want to thank you all for going on this journey with me. Without all of you, none of this would be possible. The world of creepypastas has been my home for a decade plus at this point. Internet horror in general has been my favorite medium to immerse myself in. Majora's Mask, Ben Drowned, these two coincide with each other so much that I can't really separate them. Whenever I play the game, I'm always looking for Ben to appear behind my shoulder. I want to give a shout out to Alex Hall for creating such a wonderful series. Also a big thanks to YouTuber Professor Dot Giver for doing a very comprehensive analysis of the ARG. And finally a thank you to those that run the Deducible Wiki as it was the biggest source of information and for cataloging everything. Thank you to my Patreon supporters Blow and O's, Nora Kingsley, Scott with a Name, and Alex Hilton. You all keep the channel going and I couldn't do it without you. Thank you for everyone who watches my videos and I hope you all have a good night.